Thank you so much for having me here. I think it's an honor and a privilege, and I'm, um, uh, and I'm very happy to be speaking to such a diverse group of folks. I'll try and keep my presentation very short. I do have some slides, but I'll try and go through it in about 10 minutes or so. And I'd love to keep the rest of the uh, time open for any questions. So, the, um, so today, I'm going to talk about crafting strategies to take your business to the next level. And I think what I'd like to do is start off um, with my journey, right? what I've done so far, and the kind of trajectories that I've had in my career, and in hopes that um, you know, uh, there might be some lessons in that or the, it might spark some thought. So I started out, um, I've been working now for about 12 years. I've started out with the family business. So some of you, um, I, I'm sure the women in the group would be aware of uh, the Nali group of family, uh, the Nali group of companies. So we're known for silk saris, but we also have, you know, um, a larger presence in women's ethnic wear and 34, uh, 32 stores now across India and the globe. When I started out, this was in 2005, and my qualification is actually of that of a computer engineer. So in 2005, there was a retail boom, and I'm not sure if some of you all remember that, but this was a time of great um, optimism, dynamism, hope, and I entered the family business almost accidentally. Um, and when I joined, I was 21 years old, and I didn't know anything about retail, and I didn't know anything even less about saris. So I think the first four years, um, what I did was I decided to shadow. The first, the first six months, I actually decided to shadow all of my uh, family members and all of the SVPs. A lot of people who've had many years of experience and who've clearly built the brand to where it was you know, at that point in time. Um, and that's when I realized there are some things that we do very well as a business, and there are certain things that could be improved. Um, so one big insight that, that uh, came to me was we have an opportunity to reach a younger audience and we're not doing that as well as we do to our core clientele. Now our core clientele tends to be women who wear saris on a fairly regular basis. But for the occasional wearer of saris and for the younger woman, is Nali still top of mind or does she think, no, it's, a, you know, it's my mother's brand, it's not for me? Um, so that was a hypothesis that I had. And then after six months of shadowing uh, all of the senior people, so I went to them and I said, look, this is what I think. How do we, you know, how do we investigate this? And the answer that I got from the, um, you know, from the leaders in the organization was, yes, that's a, yes, that's a thought. Um, so you tell me. <laughs> right? So this is what I was faced with. And this was my first, I guess, business challenge when I was 21. So I sat and I thought, okay, I don't know, and within the org also, we don't have that data. So how are we going to go out and how are we going to get that data? And back then, I think it was mainly just, um, um, I think it's the ignorance of youth. Sometimes you just do things, you don't even think about it, you don't plan for it. You just think, okay, I have a problem, I've got to solve it, let me just get started. And that's how I started and I said, all right, let's, uh, I caught all of the watchmen, uh, all of the security guards. And I said, all right, here's what I want you to do. Keep this clicker, and I want you to count the number of people who walk in and the number of people who walk out with bags. That's a proxy for your conversion, right? Footfalls and conversions. Now do the same thing, but keep a track of how many of them tend to be younger women in this profile. So we did that a few times, right? Weekends, weekdays, different, um, uh, different um, stores across India. And what we realized is with the younger women, the hypothesis was confirmed. They actually are not converting. First of all, they don't come. Many times they're sort of dragged by their mothers or their sisters or somebody else. So they're there under duress, right? The second thing is not only are they there under duress, whenever there is a purchase, it's typically the older woman, right, who has made the purchase. But the, um, the younger lady who's accompanied her tends to sort of, you know, have a very neutral experience and she walks away. Apart, so I had the data on it that conversions are really not happening, but now the insight into why, that still was missing. So I personally went and sat in some of these sales counters, uh, sat in where the cash registry was. And each time I saw someone um, who would come, like fitting this profile, I had asked them, so did you, and many times they didn't know, well, actually nobody knew who I was, so I was just sitting there. And then I'd asked them, did you find what you were looking for? Is there something else that, uh, you know, that you wish we had? So a lot of them were very polite and they'll say, yeah, yeah, you know, things are good. And then there were some people who 
it, when you ask them nicely, they would come up and say, yeah, you know, you don't really have the kind of products I'm looking for. And so I probed, right? And what we realized, and we saw there were, there was, there was two issues, right? And why we are not able to reach this audience. The first one was um, perception. There was a huge barrier um, wherein a lot of these folks felt, no, they, you don't even have the kind of products I'm looking for, right? So when I would have the conversation with them to say, okay, but did you check? Because we actually do have exactly the kind of products you're looking for. And then when I would send the sales boy to, you know, to fetch one, then they'd be a little bit taken aback that, oh, I didn't know even Nali had this. I thought all you had was silk saris, right? You're known for Patru. Why would you even have anything other than that? The second issue that I realized we faced, um, the second hurdle was discoverability. So these products existed, but they were not discoverable, right? And if you probe a little deeper and you ask, okay, why is that? Why are they not discoverable? What we realize is our store was completely optimized to, um, to cater to our core clientele. So these are women who would come in, they know exactly what they want, they know the kind of saris, and they know how to find it for themselves. Salespeople are also incentivized to um, optimize for sales per square foot or revenue gross margin per square foot. So what does that mean? If you have a limited square footage, you are going to optimize for your high value, high margin, high moving products, right? So if you have a clientele that's not your core clientele, they are not going to be prioritized because you, you don't have an infinite space. You can't really customize the experience to everyone. You have to make those trade-offs. And so the, the very principles that helped our business get so successful were the principles that were also hindering us in reaching out to a, uh, to a wider and a more diverse audience. So now we've got the insights. We know that there is an issue. We've quantified that. We know why there is an issue. And we've understood why both from a consumer's perspective as well as from an internal, you know, organizational perspective. So how do we actually solve this? So that was actually one of the first things that I did where we, um, we deliberated for quite a bit. And then what we realized in the end was, look, we really need to create a new sub-brand for this. As long as you try to cater to, the client, to this new audience through the format of your existing stores, it's always going to be difficult because your entire stores are are uh, built in a manner to cater to your core clientele. And that may not be the kind of experience that uh, this new clientele is, is sort of expecting. And so for the first time, we experimented with smaller formats, uh, with stores set up inside malls. And this was an experiment for all of us. And I think I'm really grateful and thankful that the family was as supportive as they were. Because back then, I think it's uh, um, like I said, it was the ignorance of youth that I asked the question and they said, okay, you answer it. And then I tried to answer it myself. And then I came up with a plan and I said, all right, let's solve it. And they all sort of backed me. And I think that now having had that, you know, having had more years of experience, I really see how rare that was. And I think a lot of the success that I've had, I will actually give credit to the opportunities that were created for me and the platform that was, you know, created for me. Um, so with that said, I've, I've kind of gone a little deep into, I think, the first four years. But post that, I think what happened was I realized um, there's a lot to be learned within, uh, within the ecosystem of a family-run business, but there's also a lot that I can't learn from within. Right? So I'd like to see what are best practices, what, are, what is it that other organizations do well um, in other sectors itself, right? in other uh, economies, and how can I inculcate all of the best practices there in order to improve and grow my own business and to make it uh, you know, sustainable and to make it really defensible. Um, and so that was when four years into it, I decided to go in for an MBA, and I graduated in 2011. Um, Worked, in fact, worked in the U.S. for another three years with McKinsey. Came back, um, strangely enough, joined Mintra, um, and I was there as part of the revenue division. And now I've kind of come full circle, come back, rejoined Nali, been here for about a year and a half now. Um, and it's a very different, and I think that's the that's the beauty of India. Our demographics are such, and the dynamism in the country is such that it, I've only been away for about seven years, but it almost feels like seventy. That there's that it's a whole different consumer, it's a whole different product, it's a whole different business environment uh, that I've come back in. And now I'm here again, back at the helm with my brother, with the rest of the family, 
um, and sort of you know uh, driving us through the next phase of our growth. Um, so with that, I'd like to move on to um, the presentation. I'll try and keep this high level and then leave a little more um, a, a little more time for questions in the end. Um, so what I've realized and what I've learned is this, right? A lot of there are a lot of different ways of doing business. So you've got different companies, and each company has different needs, different constraints, different hurdles. So you've got startups um, where I think the need really is for you to be really nimble. The risk of uh, the opportunity cost is very low, but the risk of not doing something is very high, right? And it's almost the converse of what you would find in a publicly traded organization where the opportunity cost is so high. So you really have to think 10 times about, is this the best um, use of the funds that I have, or can it be better allocated elsewhere, where I'm going to get a better ROI on it? Um, small businesses and startups are more or less similar. Um, I suppose the only difference would be on the funding, right? A lot of times what you tend to see with startups is that they do get funding from, uh, they do get capital from outside, whereas with small businesses, they tend to be self-funded at least in the initial years. Um, and of course, family businesses have their own dynamics because you work, because there are generational differences. Um, sometimes the idea, the work ethic and the core values may be the same, but the ideologies of the people at the helm may vary a little bit. So how do you navigate those waters um, while still driving the organization forward with one vision? But one thing I've realized while you've had, while you have different companies with different constraints, different needs, Almost all of them invariably follow a similar path. Now, this is highly simplistic, um, right? But at a very, very broad level, at a very high level, most organizations go through a path like this where the early years are all about proving the business model. Get the business model right, understand what your revenue model is, understand what your profit model is, right? And then the next phase, which is what we're going to talk about, is your growth years. Now, you've gotten a proven business model. How do you replicate that at scale? How do you ensure that your business becomes a self-sustaining organization that you're building you know, for posterity? And then the last part of it is actually in the maturing years. Now, maturing years doesn't mean death for an organization. What it means is your industry is maturing. Typically, if an industry is maturing, what you tend to see is consolidation. You also tend to see growth that comes through increases in market share as opposed to increases in you know, in any other way. Because if, you, if you've saturated the market or the market itself is in decline, the only way to grow is really through increase in market share. When an organization is at that phase, at the maturing phase, there are other strategies. The, the, the main way is now this is the time when you start looking at things other than organic growth. What about inorganic growth? What about acquisitions? What about entering new markets? So that while you have your cash cow business, since you know that your cash cow business is maturing, this is the time when you invest in high growth but small businesses. And very similar to, I think, the Netflix blockbuster um, example that was shared earlier. What to you seems like such a you know, piddly little business and it's never going to amount to much? may in fact, because it's growing so much, may in fact be the business of the future that is going to be a significant revenue stream for you. And so the different strategies there at the maturing year, but in the growth years, if you look at what it really takes to navigate, right? Um, there are m many more points, but these are the three ones that stick out for me. The first one is once you've got the proven business model, these are the years when you really spend uh, trying to drive operational excellence and cost efficiencies out of it. Now you've gotten the proven business models. Let's say, okay, when we do it at scale, where do we see where do we see cost efficiencies? Can we centralize certain functions? Right? Can we do certain things so that my people are, you know, so that the organization is no longer people dependent, but it becomes system dependent? Um, the other thing is, if you run if you run it the traditional way, so to speak, the profits that you generate should be sufficient for you to fuel further expansion. So as you grow from strength to strength, the corpus that you have to fuel your own expansion also increases. Now, of course, people, uh, companies take all kinds of financing uh, strategies. So you might bring in external investors, you might sort of lever up with debt. Your appetite for debt uh, will vary depending on other business decisions that you take. But invariably, all organizations, when they enter the growth phase, always have an eye towards this. I want all of my stores to be profitable. So you'll have some trade-off in you know, between how, many, how fast you want to expand and what is the percent of stores that, you're, you know, that you think is the cost of expansion. 
If I'm going to set up 100 stores, then maybe 10%, 5% of those stores shutting down is an acceptable cost, right? Because I'm chasing that. Or if you're saying, no, I, I would rather that every single store stay profitable, then I may not be able to set up 100 stores, but I'm going to set up a smaller amount of stores, but really have a tight grip on the profitability metrics and on the performance variables of it. Um, the second thing is entering new markets. And you, uh, some of you may already be aware of this. It's called an answer of matrix, but I think less than the theory. What's more, um, what's more important is the practical application of it. A lot of times when, when we think about growth, um, we, we come up with ideas like, okay, great. Now, let's say you're a, you're a player in women's ethnic wear. Oh, the next thing you need to do is men's ethnic wear, right? Or men's wear. Because you anyway have the production facilities, you have the know-how, so enter that segment. Now, if you look at this, that actually is you taking a new, let me explain this a little bit. So um, on the x-axis, what you have is products and services, right? So um, on your left-hand side is existing, and on your right-hand side is new. So if you take, and similarly on the y-axis, you have markets. Now, if you take an existing product to an existing market, that's a market penetration gain. That's essentially you saying, okay, I've set up 10 stores, I'm going to set up another 20, 30, 40 stores. That's market penetration. Taking an existing product to a new market is market development. All right, I'm going to go into new geographies, or I'm going to go to different clienteles. So the same products, but then I'm going to cater it to a different audience. Taking, the, um, uh, taking new products to the existing market, that's product development, right? So now this is my core clientele, but um, the same clientele also has an appetite for, say, jewelry or some other adjacency, right? So I'm going to introduce that new product, but to the very existing clientele. And diversification is actually the toughest one to pull out because now you're taking a new, brand new product, so internally you've got to rejig your ways of operating, you've got to create, almost uh, uh, recreate from scratch, you know, the excellence that you have developed in your existing products for the new product, and then also understand from scratch what it means to cater to that new, or, uh, to that new market. Oftentimes when we think of growth, a lot of times what we do is we first think of diversification. But what I would encourage everyone is think through this. What is it, um, both from an ease of implementation, both from a probability of success standpoint, as well as you know, the, the potential uh, impact right, that you're going to have, the largeness of that market, does it make sense? And this is one good way of sort of thinking through it. And the last one, of course, I've touched upon it uh, a little bit, navigating the growth years. This is also the time when increasingly we start seeing a move away from people dependency to more systems and processes. Yeah, so I'll just leave this slide up here, and I think uh, let's move on to maybe just one or two questions, and I'm happy to you know, connect with you all. Uh, hi, Lavinia, my name is Preeti. I work uh, with, I have my own line of jewelry, mm -hmm. so work in the retail space. I just wanted to understand uh, with, uh, even with your diverse number of stores across the country, are you also facing a challenge in uh, the presence of digital space being present online? What's your take on that? So the quick answer to that is I think it's a matter of perspective. Is it a threat or an opportunity? Right? So digital is a channel. right? So like the way that physical and offline is a channel. Now if you come, come at it from the angle of it's an opportunity, then it's, it's just another way of reaching your audience. Now, there are other players that have, um, that have become very excellent in navigating, in, you know, in, in sort of building that platform and in reaching that audience through online. But what is it that stops us from doing the same thing? Right? So the way that I look at it, and at Nali, we actually, one of the things I did when I came back was actually start off the e-commerce division. So we have a Nali.com that's doing quite well now. It's much smaller compared to the rest of the organization, but it's doing quite well. We've really invested in it in the last couple of years. And it's the same philosophy, right? If you don't want to be disrupted, you've got to disrupt yourself, right? So if you don't want to be blockbustered out of the, you know, out of the market, then you've got to incubate your own little Netflix. Thank you. I'm Lakshmi Ishwar from uh, Flow Bangalore. So my question, uh, first of all, thank you for a very insightful talk. We really enjoyed it. Uh, uh, I've got a good insight into how uh, business families think and how they progress. Uh, my question to you is, 
uh, the sari wearing population of India now, the younger generation, uh, the office going generation, uh, I think it's dwindling, it's uh, reducing. So how does Nali uh, view this and what are the steps taken? That is one. My second question is uh, about the weavers, because we've been off late hearing a lot of uh, the conditions of weavers and all of that. So uh, I wanted to see how a sari uh, store like yours, uh, multi-store multi uh, uh, operation, how do you deal with this? How do you uh, do something to improve the condition of the weavers and to keep their handloom uh, weaving alive? Okay, so both excellent questions. I'll take the first one. Um, if you, does anyone here know what is the size of, say, the women's ethnic wear space? Any guesses? All right, so the size, yes. No, the, in, in crores or, you know. I'm sorry? Okay, so it's actually 85,000 crores. 85,000. Now, what's 1% of that? Can you name one organization that has achieved 1% market penetration? Right? So while you're right that it does appear anecdotally, and I think it is true that the trend is in the urban markets to move away from saris, when the market is that large, 85,000 crores, and growing at 10% year on year, is this the time for us to worry Right? and then to chase this, or is this the time for us to look at it as an opportunity and say it's an 85,000 crore company, why is my business not even 5% of it? What can I do to even grow there? Right? So that's the approach that we have adopted, which is not to say that you, you know, you've got your head in the sand, but I think always let the numbers guide you. Right? Look at that and to see, look, which is the biggest burning um, problem right now? Is it one of growth, is it one of expansion, or is it one of this entire market is in decline, and therefore we really have to get out of it and then enter some other market and do that with speed. Um, the other question that you raised. So there are, um, and I'm happy, I think in the interest of time, I'm happy to take this offline as well. But the best way I think um, to effect any kind of social impact, any kind of you know, change, is for businesses to work very closely with the communities that they are both dependent, dependent on and that, uh, you know, and that depend on them. So what we do, and it's not very known, but in a personal capacity, all of us are involved um, you know, in some philanthropy where we work very closely with the weaving community. We've adopted some of these clusters. Um, and then we work with them um, on a number of issues. Right? So some of these, and a lot of times you tend to find in handloom industries because the, the, um, the suppliers, the weaving communities, the artisans are individually quite small, that they don't have the kind of clout or the sort of business power uh, to influence decisions at a policy level. But these are the places, I think, where business families um, can sort of come in and then they can represent those interests. So we work both in our personal capacity with the Kanjivaram weavers. Um, we've also worked um, you know, while sitting in uh, the Retailers Association of India to sort of promote some of these causes. And that's something that I would encourage all of us here in the room, right? Because we are owner, founders, promoters, you know, CEOs or aspiring CEOs. Um, that it, it's, it's not just our business, but I think it's our livelihood, it's our country, right? And if there is a way in which we, by doing business, we can bring along everyone else into that wealth creation, I think let's do it. Superb. Thank Superb. Thank you very much, Lavanya.